Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt and Max, talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we're going to be talking about the short story collection Third Reich Victorious, written by Peter Saras. Peter Saras, we like the guy. Oh, uh, we we love Peter Saras. He's uh, one of the, I think, one of the better alternate history writers out there. And this is a compilation, sort of in line with. It's in the same series of Cold War Hot and Rising Sun Victorious, but it deals with scenarios involving the Third Reich during World War II, so Nazi Germany, and various ways they could have won the war or had a better outcome than they did in reality. And the first story in this collection, The Little Admiral, actually starts in World War I, pre-World War I even. Yeah, actually, this is really interesting. This is by Wade Dudley, another one of our favorites. Mm. Always has great stories in these anthologies. Absolutely love Wade Dudley. He's great. He does good work. He's funny, really funny. And this is The Little Admiral, obviously, as all of Wade Dudley's stories are, is naval-focused. And in this one, has a really interesting divergence. And the divergence is Hitler, based on some fluke, joins the German Navy in World War I and fights on a battleship and then he becomes a submarine commander and he becomes severely injured. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that because of his experience in the Navy rather than the army, he sort of takes a whole different approach to the problems facing Germany in the 20s and the 30s. That's right. Like, for instance, he encourages the development of aircraft carriers mm -hmm. and all sorts of other uh, uh, naval innovations that were not done at all yep. in real life like like matt what did the kriegsmarine actually do other than submarines because well, they had small well they had i mean the bismarck and the Tirpitz. they had smaller battleships and battle cruisers but they never were you know there wasn't a whole lot of investment in it simply because the german army has always been what gave germany its power dating back to the prussians and before simply they just don't have as big a coastline there was no need like britain to develop as big a navy for germany but this story sort of takes a different approach to that. And uh, and and so it basically parallels Hitler's rise is relatively similar to the way it is in it was in reality. But there's it's the blue shirts, not the brown shirts. <laughs> right. Another important divergence is that Hitler starts off a little anti-Semitic, but he loses it. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, though, he, he goes for uh, extreme hatred towards Anglos. He yeah. hates British people. He hates Britain because in this, because he was a, he fought that he would have fought Britain primarily in the German Navy in World War One, and then the the British kept the blockade of Germany through the Ver, the negotiations of the Versailles Treaty. So a lot of people starved to death in the winter of 1918, 1919. So his hatred is developed entirely towards Britain. So none of you know the major. Uh, I, I guess he never speaks about it directly, but it's implied that none of the major, uh, you know, Jewish scientists leave Germany because they don't have a reason to because there's no anti-Semitism directed towards them. Mm -hmm. Which deals into the end of the story where there's nuclear bombs. Yes, but, but, we'll get, but we'll we're get getting to, ahead of ourselves. We're getting ahead of it. But basically where it gets interesting is that Germany plans out World War I here, or World War II, excuse me, but they started off with basically a British Pearl Harbor using these aircraft carriers to launch a Pearl Harbor style attack on Scapa Flow, which is one of the largest British naval bases at the time. It was located up in the Orkney Islands, which are just north of Scotland. And it's just devastating. And then it continues on sort of relatively on the same path. Although I do like he interweaves talking about how the German army isn't as good. It takes right. them longer to conquer Poland and it takes them longer to win in, in the Netherlands and in France when they invade in 1940. But he talks about how great the German Navy is and how it's really reducing the power of Britain. It even mentions how they launch an aircraft carrier raid on Halifax in Nova <laughs> Scotia in Canada. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, and basically there's an invasion of of Britain and they win. And so, and then it talks about they later invade Russia in 1943, but they're really bogged down and the Russians really sort of slow up the Germans and eventually ends with atomic bomb strikes. It, it ends with atomic bomb strikes, uh, a theme in this short story collection. Yes, yes. Um, uh, also an interesting note is the fact that the author of the James Bond novels, Ian Fleming, ends up murdering Hitler. Yes, in, he in assassinates him like later on in the, well, it mentions it sort of as a minor mm -hmm. fact. And then it talks about someone writing on one of the fake footnotes, because they do that similar fake footnotes we've talked about where they have like the star next to them and talks about someone's writing from the, the British ghetto or the Anglo ghetto, That's ghetto right. somewhere <laughs> thing. I love that stuff. I love it when they do that stuff. It, it was really, it, it, adds a, it adds a nice dimension. And we're going to be talking about that later with some other stories that maybe didn't do that as much. Yeah, unfortunately. And, and we're not saying that you have to do it to an extreme extent, but it gives 
a nice, some nice world building, you know, that, that, that it engages the reader beyond simply the, the, the divergence in the scenario itself. Right, right. The second story in this collection is Disaster at Dunkirk, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, basically the point in this one is, is that it relies on a really uh, a divergence that almost happened, which is uh, Lord Halifax uh, becomes Prime Minister of Britain on May 10th, 1940, rather than Winston Churchill. And Lord Halifax, who later went on to be the ambassador to the United States during World War II, was a very well-known and well-respected British politician before the war. Very old-school British, as you'd imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and he was actually Neville Chamberlain's first choice. Huh. But in reality, he, Neville Chamberlain wanted him to be prime minister. Hmm. See, I, before I read this collection, I'd never actually heard of uh, this Lord Halifax fellow. Um, he seems to be a reoccurring character in these stories, usually as a man that ruins things. <laughs> like he shows up in the Zhukov versus Rommel story and a couple ones like that. And usually it's to be like a total idiot that capitulates to the Germans as much as possible. Well, in reality, I, Halifax wasn't, you know, pro-German in the way that Oswald Mosley was and other people, but he definitely advocated more. I, I think he was advocating for some sort of peace with Germany. I, I have to do more research on that, but he was not as pugnacious as Churchill, and I think he was still sort of a holdover of a lot of people from the 30s who didn't exactly like Hitler, but maybe didn't want to engage in another world war. Appeasement. Yeah, sort of a holdover from the appeasement. So in this one, he becomes prime minister, and Churchill is, uh, I think, still Lord of the Admiralty. He has a major position, but not as big here, and sort of the, the Battle of France goes the same way, but some stuff breaks in favor of the Germans, and Dunkirk is a disaster. The whole British army, the, the British Expeditionary Force is captured, so 200,000 plus men lost. How, how plausible is that actually? Because I know a lot of people say, oh, the Germans stopped because of incompetence, they, they didn't take the advantage, they, they, uh, for, they mysteriously didn't go on, and, and basically there was a miracle at Dunkirk. Is yeah, it's just, this is really heavily debated until this day. People. The historians sort of fight with each other over whether the, the Germans could have gone forward. There's some who say, no, they really had run out of steam. Others who said they really could have pushed harder if they wanted to. As far as I can tell, let me just put it like this. Compared to some of the other divergences here, this is very plausible. I think with some tweaking of things happening in early June of 1940, they could have, the Germans could have over, overrun Dunkirk. They would have got, had a lot of heavy fighting from the British, but compared to some of like the later where the German ones Germans and developed the atomic bomb like this is much more plausible and could have happened and 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 it would have been a, just as much a disaster as that is a scenario sort of posits because without sort of the 200,000 plus men who escaped or maybe even 300,000 from Dunkirk became the nucleus of the British army that would go on to fight throughout the second world war without them it's very hard to see Britain continuing its fight right right and Britain does not continue its fight uh, no. for very long in this story. They're, they're overwhelmed. A lot of bad things happen. Operation Sea Lion goes forward. Yes, forward. it goes yeah. forward. And it succeeds, yeah. Yeah, it, it succeeds. And very humorously, uh, Winston Churchill, totally fed up with Halifax's complete incompetence, decides he's going to pull a... Charles I move and <laughs> invade the House of Commons to arrest him and take over as prime minister. Exactly, the next Cromwell. Except it doesn't go as well as it did for Cromwell no, but, because everybody dies. Yeah, yeah. He uh, Well, he walks in, it's like talks about how he like marches into Parliament holding a Thompson submachine gun with a bunch of, you know, uh, Royal Marines following him and a huge gunfight breaks out and like... And it talks about it at the end, like everyone's dead. He's dead. Halifax is dead. Like the whole government, they all just get just riddled in this just massive shootout in the dark. It's like almost like out of a Quentin Tarantino movie. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, some sort of crazy Hollywood action film. Just people just, you know, blazing away like in a big Mexican standoff. And um, but it, it was a very interesting end to it. But the point is, is that it, it's it's very well done. I liked it. Hmm. And the, the divergence is particularly well done because it is so plausible and yeah. almost really did happen. Yeah, yeah. The, the next story we're going to talk about is about the Battle of Britain, 
where basically the Germans, instead of focusing on terror attacks and the bombing of London, they focus almost entirely on the RAF, taking out yep. Britain's ability to resist their campaign. And I really like this one because this is about as plausible as a change that could have happened because the policy the Germans pursue in this one was the policy they were initially following at the beginning of the Battle of Britain in July and August of 1940. The the majority of the German attacks were meant to sort of whittle down the strengths of the RAF. They were attacking British ports, British airfields. They were they were aiming to do that, but based on several reasons, Hermann Göring's sort of incompetence and and uh, overzealousness, plus um, some British bombers striking some German cities, I think including Berlin, caused them to change the focus of their attack on the British cities. And while this caused overwhelming devastation, especially in London and a few other cities, and killed tens of thousands of civilians, this gave the RAF breathing room to restock and really challenge the Germans in September and October of 1940 and win a decisive victory. Yeah. And but I in this one, that original policy continues. Right. And in, in the end, I think they win entirely by the air. Yes. Like, I don't even think there is a sea lion in this story. No, no, as far as I can remember, no. But it, which is hard to see Britain collapsing under that alone, but without it, without some sort of invasion. But well, very well Winston Churchill does die. So yes. the soul of Britain is dead. Yes, <laughs> that's true. It's well done. And again, that this is a very plausible divergence. And it, hell, I mean, it was already happening. It just this is just a continuation of it rather than it stopping. Uh, another interesting and very plausible scenario is one about uh, what if Rommel had won at El Alamein? Mm -hmm. I thought this one was pretty interesting. Yeah, I liked uh, it. I liked it too. We're not probably going to talk about it that much. Yeah, but, we're just going to kind of gloss but over it. But it could. It, 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 there was a potential for this, given how poor British generalship was in North Africa for you know a year and a half, and Rommel being a very good general, not as built. We're not going to build him up as much as some other people do later <laughs> in this. We'll talk about later in this this episode, but he. He could have won. I just don't know if he could have expanded on a, a major victory in the way yeah. he does here, because he gets all the way to like Iraq, yeah. to Basra, <laughs> um, in this, and it, to the oil, to so this British oil sources. And I just don't know if that's plausible, given mm -hmm. the Africa Corps at times was so tiny compared to what was going on on the Eastern Front. Rommel was barely getting peanuts. And uh, another problem I have with this story is at the very end, it ends with Rommel going back to Berlin, feeling very pleased with himself, and that's the ending. <laughs> There's no ramifications of what have happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's no, there's no even mention of what happens next in the war. Yeah. So okay, I know the short story collection is called Third Reich Victorious, and this is a victorious moment. But what happens next? Yeah. Like, does the war? How how do things progress from this point? I don't know. And. It just it would have been nice to expand on that because mm. I don't know if that's a death sentence to the allies It may make the war a lot more difficult But and then I think our next one we want to talk about though on top of this um, Is one where Turkey joins the Germans in attacking Russia in 1942. I love this premise. This premise is extremely interesting. Yeah, really really good premise um, Though I have a little bit of the of a problem with the way that the story is set out because I feel like the whole story is just a constant series of, and this division did that, and this division did this, and they had fighting, and they won, and this division over here lost, and there's really not much of a human element to it. Like many of the other authors in this collection, they'll talk about a battle, and they'll digress and say, such and such a soldier remarked by saying this and that, and da da da, and interesting little factoids, mm -hmm. which doesn't really happen very much in, in this one. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And But obviously, the author knows a ton about Turkey and oh, Turkish man. politics, and he really... Yeah, yeah. And like, the great thing is, is he admits at the end, in the sort of reality section, he said that... Um, that he was stretching reality here. So this divergence was unlikely and that everything indicated that the, the Turkish government, while there may have been elements who were sort of more pro-German, were not, were very much in favor of staying neutral. Especially because I think most Turks would think back to World War I mm -hmm. and see what happened to, the, to them at the end of that conflict mm -hmm. and think, yeah. maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't well, get involved. Well, do remember, technically, Turkey joined the war against Nazi Germany in, like, February of 1945 in reality. Oh, really? But I just didn't know didn't, that. Yeah, I, yeah, they just didn't contribute anything. Oh, so, okay. But the point well. is, is that it's an interesting divergence. What is unfortunate is they don't expand on past like November of 1942. Yeah, it ends before Stalingrad is even over. 
which I mean, come on. And I really wish that this author uh, would have expanded a little bit farther on that because some of that stuff is so interesting. Like yeah. the ramifications of this, because like the allies win here, like Turkey is in big trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, yeah. Cause, cause I can imagine in a world like this where it sets back the war a little bit, but the allies eventually win. Like Joseph Stalin saying like, oh yeah, half of Eastern Turkey, that like belongs to me now. <laughs> Istanbul, yeah, that's Constantinople now. I mean, there's, <laughs> But I, I like the divergence. Right. It's interesting, and he, he does a great job of doing sort of the division on division, talking about specialty. Like, there's joint operations, which I love that. In the end, there's a joint operation between the British and the Russians, like divisions oh, yeah. fighting side by side in the Caucasus against the Turks and a German, like, expeditionary corps of mountain troops. Yeah, but, yeah, that stuff was pretty darn cool. Mm -hmm. I like it. But overall, we, we just wish that there had been a little bit more development because it's such a good divergence. Yeah, I, th I think... This might be one of the most interesting scenarios in the whole collection. Mm -hmm. Like this is this is some pretty cool stuff because the ramifications are just gigantic, absolutely yeah, yeah. gigantic. Absolutely. And then next, we want to talk about. There's a scenario called the Luftwaffe Triumphant, and it basically involves what if the Luftwaffe had planned out its counter to the combined bomber offensive, the American and British uh, bomber offensive against against Ger against Germany, if they had developed Me 262s. Uh, jet fighters earlier and better anti-aircraft guns, but also like control systems if they developed better radar control systems and used it more effectively and mm -hmm. really sort of if you just got rid of Hermann Goering. I don't know if they do that in this, but they basically like ignore everything he says and listen <laughs> to these other people who were, you know, I guess more competent. Spe speaking of anti-aircraft systems, I love how near the end of the story when the war inevitably goes on longer than it did in real life that they talk about uh, missile guidance systems like they have anti-aircraft missiles yeah they have like rudimentary sams and <laughs> sort of things but i love that oh and the british use vampires against uh yeah not literal vampires but the jet <laughs> vampire jets which were close to being introduced i mean well actually people well the germans use jets but don't forget that the British used Gloucester Meteor jet fighters were actually used in world war ii hmm. they were introduced in i think late 1944 I don't know if they were ever used in air-to-air -air combat against the Germans. They were used against V-1s, and they did shoot down huh. V-1 rockets. And they did do at the very end, in like April of 1945, they released some of them uh, to be used on the front. And I think they were used in like some strafing missions. So they did see some combat. But in this one, because of this this use of this this Wunderwaffe, as it's called, they defeat the, the, the Allied bomber campaign. And the war extends into 1946. And for some reason, the defeat of the Allied bomber campaign also leads to not only a delay in the actions of the Western allies in France, which is a, maybe a little bit more understandable, but for some reason also stops the Russians, <laughs> which, <laughs> right. which is a big weakness because however the bomber offensive goes, I don't know how that leads to you know the Russians getting slowed down to the point where they're on the Vistula for like two years and not able to, to breach it. And uh, uh, we should also mention the fact that at the end of this story, mm -hmm. it, it finally comes to the Allies using not not one, not two, but I believe it is 12 nuclear yes, bombs. a dozen nuclear bombs. <laughs> on Ger And they use, you know, they have to bring in B-29s. And then, but the crazy thing is after, it's like they use the entirety, 12 nuclear bombs, the entirety of the Allied supply of them. And then it takes another five months of fighting <laughs> to subdue Germany. And I don't, I just don't see how... The Germans having lots of ME-262 jet fighters equals the German populace <laughs> is willing to absorb 12 uh, atomic bomb attacks plus all this ferocious fighting. It's, it's, it's pretty silly. I'm not going to lie to you. Now, devil's advocate here. Devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. The, the bomber offensive is totally unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Maybe the German morale is so good that they don't mind like 12 German cities decimated and, and radiation poisoning everywhere. That's fine. Don't worry about it. I don't know, but uh, I wish it was explained more. But it's an interesting divergence. It, it is, yeah. And it's it's akin to in one of the other episodes we talked about, I think one of the earliest ones, about how there's a scenario where there are more ME-262s, and it causes a reduction in the American combined part of the bomber offensive that the Amer it's the Alfred Price, the uh, jet fighter menace. I was about to say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's in... Um, in the Hitler, I think it's the Hitler options. The Hitler it's, options. It was, it's sort of a book akin to this. But so what it does is that in that one, it's a limiting of the American side, but the British side is completely fine. Because remember, they don't explain in this why the British are also defeated because the British use night bombing. And I don't know if the Germans could have come up with effective jet fighters for night fighting. I know they tried using ME-262 
night fighters, a few of them, but I don't know. Mm. I don't know. They don't explain that. So funny because the M E two sixty two shows up multiple times in Third Reich Victorious. Yeah. They show up in the in mm-hmm. the Jet Fighter Menace. Yeah. It's it's just But scary. in the Jet Fighter Menace they deal with it in like a realistic way. Yeah. Like yeah. the allies quickly like as soon as they're introduced, the allies are working on ways to neutralize it. <laughs> they're not just like, oh well <laughs> That's a that's a problem in a lot of these stories is that like the allies do something dumb and then like someone in charge is like, No, we have to do this dumb thing. There's Again. Just, there's no way that I'm gonna let you mitigate this dumb thing that we just did. <laughs> we have to keep morale high. No, we can't bring these civilian boats to evacuate the, the our British soldiers in France. That would hurt morale. We can't do it. We'd rather them just all get captured because that's, you know, better <laughs> for way morale. Way better for us. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So dumb. Uh so, okay, the ME-262 in a lot of these stories is just like a one, well, it, a wonder waff. It's like this magical thing that wins no matter what. I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of problems with them. Well, yeah, the problem is, is that the, the engines were the biggest problem, is that they burned out too quickly. They, I think there was only 60 usable flying hours before they had to be completely rehauled. I not, mean, not to mention the fact that I think their operational time is only like a couple hours. Yeah, it, it was, training on them was difficult. They used up gas and aviation fuel at an enormous rate. And also, they were super slow landing in taking off. That's actually where most of them were shot down by American yeah. fighters, is that they figured out they had to slow down to really, really slow speeds to land and take off. It took a while for the engines to build up speed, and they would just use Mustangs to intercept them. They would just circle around waiting for them to either land or take off and then shoot them down doing that because they couldn't match them for speed mm-hmm. in the air. They'd just be like, well, we'll just send out patrols and wait to see as because they would figure out what airfields they'd be at and just fly constant patrols over them and just shoot them down once they saw them taking off. That's really cool. So, oh. yeah. So, but the point is, is that they, maybe they give too much weight to their effectiveness and you can't, I don't know. They don't talk about changing anything major about it. So, mm-hmm. um, and then going on, we have two more we want to talk about. First is a one where the Germans develop an atomic bomb. This one was really, really good. I, I like this one a lot. This is four star Lindsay, mm-hmm. the man who wrote the fraternal war yes. and cold war hot, a story I really liked a lot, and just like that one, this one has the use of nuclear weapons. Yes, the Germans develop the atom bomb first, and it's in April of 1944. They use it against Moscow and London. To not much avail. <laughs> no, well, the the Allies eventually use their own atomic weapons, and they invade, and they actually war ends earlier. It ends in yeah. like November of 1944, because yeah. Hitler gets basically like obliterated by an atom bomb, if I recall correctly. That's right. They blow up his bunker. Uh, he wakes up. He like stumbles around for a little while, and he's like, "Man, it's getting really hot in here. What's going on? Oh no! <laughs> oh, they used a the nuke on me. Oh. and yeah. then he dies." Well, the point is, is that it's really well written and it's an interesting divergence. But again, we talked about this in other episodes. Germans developing atomic bombs really unlikely. Here, it's just in like 1942. The Germans just invest a ton of money in yeah. atomic bomb research. No, I'm sorry. If you're gonna do, if you want to do a story like this and be realistic, the changes have to come way earlier in the yeah. 30s. Absolutely. Uh, long-term investment. I mean, the Manhattan Project took, oh, like basically four years to achieve, and that's with the United States pouring untold amounts of resources into it. Just resources I don't think Germany could have spared in the midst of World War II. Uh, the two, like these are the first two bombs they make, and they just decide, decide to immediately use them, and they work, which mm-hmm. is a little, uh, <laughs> yeah. And they have the correct delivery system. I don't know if the HE-177. Uh, yeah, they, they had like a, what is it, Hinkle bombers or whatever? Uh, yeah, HE-177, the Heinkel, like four big four. I think there was a, a four engine. Oh, and they're also direct hits, too. I mean, but also this whole point of, is, I think you pointed this out as, as we were talking about this before we started, is that the Germans also don't have a problem using, you know, Jewish physics. Yeah, so-called which Jewish was, which physics. Is, which really held back the, the German program in real life because they refused to use a lot of research by Jewish scientists because it was Jewish physics. And obviously, from their point of view they said it couldn't be correct and that really doomed them because their best scientists went to the united states uh like einstein for instance yeah exactly and and many others so the point is is that it's interesting it's very well written very well done Mm. not super realistic but 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 i think it's an interesting piece of alternative and i'm glad that they did it and then the last one we want to talk about is this rommel versus jukov scenario and yeah. this comes at the end, and it's actually an extension of Disaster at D-Day. That's right. P- Peter Soros coming back, doing a bookend to the story he started in Disaster mm-hmm. at D-Day. Basically, Rommel coming off of his fantastic, stunning victory mm-hmm. over the Allies at D-Day, 
and the assassination uh, of Hitler after the assassination of Hitler and all the other bad guys yeah, they all just get in together in one chateau and they just and Rommel just has it leveled with an explosion that's an right that's right and um, basically uh, somehow <laughs> like through the force of extreme incompetence and idiocy both America and Britain come together and say oh we really need to just just cash out of this war oh it's hopeless there's no way we could possibly win. And, and basically, they make a separate peace. Basically, what Rommel negotiates is that Germany... It gets back its POWs. Gets back its POWs. It gets out of all of its occupied territory. The Allies get to occupy... In the West. In the West, not yeah, in the West. of course, which yeah. we're getting to in just a second yeah. here. The Russians not part of this deal. Yes. And uh, that's where the focus of the story is, because mm -hmm. Rommel literally crash lands into the eastern front he's on a uh, he's on a transport plane he gets shot down he pulls himself out of the wreckage <laughs> basks in the sunlight jumps into a kubelwagen and just goes and uh what comes next is um fantastic <laughs> to say the least well he basically he has he whips the german army into shape and they they basically it, it comes down to in february of 1945 the russians launched this all-out offensive in central poland and rommel defeats it and he yeah. leads this the red army dry and they have to come to this sort of sort of bitter peace agreement and he defeats the full force of the red army even without the americans and the british like the red army is an unbelievably well-oiled yeah. formidable war machine R remember this, this is after operation Bagration. so the after the obliteration of an entire german army group yeah it, so this is how do we say i think max you put it the best when you said you know here saras is in full-blown uh, saint rommel mode <laughs> Yes, it, this feels like somebody's writing the the hagiography of of Saint Rommel, just talking about all of his works and deeds and and his miracles that he performed. <laughs> and, and it just it's, it, it, but it's very well written and entertaining. Yeah. And we it, don't want to rip on Taras too hard because we love the work that he does. And this, we're so glad he does this alternate history because I say this is some of the best that's out there. This guy is great. I love Saras. And here's something that I really like in this story mm -hmm. is lots of fake footnotes yes. i love that yes oh it's so good <laughs> oh yeah, it gives such great depth to it it's yeah exactly we're just going to quarrel with the 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 rommel being able to defeat the russians at this point yeah yeah but i mean i got it, 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 it people people like rommel a lot you know make a story where rommel's the main character and he does all this cool stuff i mean it, it, he actually it, even in the beginning executes the commandant of dachau right he that's, shoots him to death that's right yeah right? or yeah. something like that it, it just which yeah. I'm not complaining about that. Yeah, yeah so yeah. It's, it's very, it's, it's well done. We don't want to be too hard on it, but we just have to say, this is really hard to see how something like this could work because at this point, like the German army had been savaged heavily. And I don't know if six months of peace, even with more POWs coming from the US and Britain, mm -hmm. if that's enough to stop the full weight of the Red Army at that point. Yeah, I, I also like how Stalin and Beria and Zhukov, they're all like, they're all, cast as like power rangers villains they're all like haha and after we're done with germany we're gonna take over america <laughs> gonna gonna put a stake in the heart of capitalism forever <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, overall we we like it's a good it's this is a good book i don't know if it's as strong as rising sun victorious in my opinion I, I think it's a little bit weaker than rising sun victorious and i think it's also weaker than cold war hot i love cold war hot a lot cold war hot is really good the thing that's cool about cold war hot is that it's all these different divergent things uh not everything goes the same way like for, like for instance the title third reich victorious you're kind of tied down by that because yeah, yeah. every single one of your stories the germans have to win it's they, not even yeah they have to win in some way even if it's not like a total victory in the war mm -hmm. it's like some aspect of it the the third reich has to win which actually you know i guess if you if you really think about it that turkish story is not the third reich winning it's turkey winning and the third reich <laughs> maybe winning in the future who knows well they never gave us the details so. yeah exactly which uh which is another weakness of this is that mm -hmm. a lack of fake footnotes and a lack of wacky far off in the future crazy stuff happening which well, i think this is for some authors because these are individual authors writing their stories i think for some of them just don't do mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. saras and dudley are the best about including they're fake footnotes they're so good um, uh, like like you know, the Draca series has its weaknesses, but at least it has resonance. You know, things echo through eternity, like like stuff has consequences. 
Yeah. But this overall, don't want to be too hard. It's mm. a good foray. It's an interesting, obviously they were going to do this topic if they're doing anthologies like this. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. Um, just, you know, these are just our quibbles with it, but overall entertaining yeah, and better yeah. than uh, a lot of alternate history out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, overall, I think that's about it. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Give it a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. I recommend it. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is Max signing off. And this is Matt signing off. Have a good day, guys.